Hi everyone, welcome back to Real Gunners TV and today I'd like to welcome Tom Watt as our guest, first guest, sorry, on for our channel. So, um, hi Tom, uh, for those hi. who don't know you, could you tell our viewers a little bit about yourself? Yeah, um, well, just, well, the important thing is I've been watching Arsenal since the mid-60s, so I've got a bit of history with the football club. Um, but, and also, I've worked for the club doing kind of uh, TV stuff and uh, live events and one thing and another. Um, but yeah, I've been a, I've been watching since the mid 60s and I've had a season ticket since 71, 72. So um, I'm a bit kind of I've been there, sort of been there quite a while, one way or another. But um, so I'm uh, I, I was I'm an actor. Um, probably a lot of people still people of a certain age, not your age, would remember um, I was in EastEnders for the first three years it was on and, um, you know, did, I've done a lot of acting since, but I've, I've, all, I've always been interested in football and I guess interested in writing too. So um, more and more I've, 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 I've focused on, on writing, that's books particularly, and on broadcasting, um, a lot of work for Talk Sport, for Radio 5, for Radio 4, for um, and for Arsenal, indeed, um, and um, and then the last kind of seven or eight years, I've I've done quite a lot of um, uh, making uh, sports documentaries. Um, so it's kind of it's pretty varied, really. Right at the moment, I'm working on a new book, which is a private commission for a family um, to tell the story of, you know, to help the uh, the kind of the the uh, the grandmother, the, the matriarch of the family who's now uh, pushing 80, helping her to tell her life story, which is a really, really good story, but that's a kind of private commission. And then I'm doing a lot of work for uh, EA Sports on the FIFA game. I've, I've been involved with that for the last five years or so. Um, oh. Just helping on the one hand with uh, stories, helping to develop stories, you know, for the journey, for story mode, but now also working on the script that appears in the game. Uh, the text and just making sure that's um, as good as it can be. So, um, yeah, it's, it's busy. But those are the two things really I'm working on at the moment. Also doing some podcasts with um, Tony Adams for his Sporting Chance charity. I've been working on those. But oh, those wow. really, we got those done really before um, before lockdown. Now it's just a case of checking they're OK and making sure we get them uh, ready to go out sort of thing. So. Um, Lucky, really. I've been really busy during lockdown, so it hasn't been too much of a hasn't been too much of a pain, really. Um, so, uh, how did your love for our our club begin? How did your journey start with Arsenal? I would just look. It was my local club. Do you know what I mean? That was it, it's as it's as simple as that. Um, I was I grew up just off the Caledonian Road. Took me and me old man about. 25 minutes to walk from home to the clock end. Um, I was interested in football, you know, I used to play at school and, you know, not, and I wasn't any good, but I, I, I liked it. And, um, you know, everybody used to talk about football all the time. And um, so I was keen on going and my dad worked at a local secondary school and he knew, uh, knew a couple of the people, a couple of people involved with the club, um, particularly Bob Wilson. Who, who used to keep goal? He was um, he was a teacher. He used to come in and do some coaching at my dad's school, and Charlie George used to go to my dad's school. So, and there were a couple of other people, and Terry Burton also was part of the uh, an Arsenal team that won the FA Youth Cup in '71. He was also at the school, so it was um, you know he was he was up for going to football with me, and that was the start of it really. Um, do you remember one of your very first games or? Just one of your most memorable games you've been to? Not really. I don't really, you know, the last, the first year or two I was going, it wasn't really about the game. I didn't really understand what I was watching. I didn't really understand football. I didn't, but what I loved was the kind of, you know, I guess part of it was spending time with my dad. Um, and, you know, just going to, there's nothing like, you know, we, You'd have to for big games. You'd have to leave home about midday. You'd have to be stat. You know, you queue up at the turnstile. You get in your position for maybe one o'clock because you know there's going to be fifty thousand people in the place. You want a decent view. 
and just all the build up. You're waiting for the game to start, and you know it's a completely different experience to what it's like now. You know, it was it was a it was a much bigger deal to be honest. It was a much much bigger deal. You know, football was the whole of a Saturday. It weren't just something that you fit in. You know, f- supporters who go to every away game, they'll know what it's like for them now. It was it was like that for home games back then. Um, you know, it was it was a whole day. And uh, so it was, as I say, it was being with my dad. It was standing on the terrace. It was watching everything that was going on around me, listening songs, people talking about football, watching the players come out, singing the songs. Do you know what I mean? All of that. Um, you know, sometimes there'd be a bit of trouble in the crowd, all of that stuff. You just sort of, you just kind of got, I just got a bit transfixed by the whole thing. And so it wasn't really until... I would think I'd been watching, I've been going to Arsenal probably for a year or two before I start really remembering games, you know, um, sort of 67, 68, because we were a very poor side or a very underachieving side when I started going. Uh, but there were some good young players and those young players started to come good, I would think, sort of late, late 60s, really. So I remember, you know, I remember games... I remember a couple of like Leeds were the team back then. They were horrible, and um, there are I remember now. Some, games, some games against them in the league. You know, people getting sent off and fighting and all that. And, um, I remember a, a nil-nil draw where we played most of the game with ten men. That felt like this fantastic victory. Um, and then, you know, we did start going to one or two away games as well. And I guess. I remember going to see us play Leeds, actually, in the League Cup final in 68. And then I remember two games against Tottenham in 69, semi-finals of the League Cup, where we won 1-0 at Arsenal in the first leg. Um, uh, John Radford scored. And then we went to White Hart Lane. Of course, me and my dad went over to White Hart Lane for the second leg as well and stood at the Paxton Road end. And um, we drew one all. It's probably the most violent game of football I've ever seen in my life. But we drew one all and, you know, we got through to the final sort of thing. And uh, the final was a disaster. We lost to Swindon. Um, But those couple of games, they really sort of stick in my memory. Um, What would you say is the most, one of the most standout performances you've seen from a a Pacific player? Um, well, probably my f- still my favourite game, even probably as much or even maybe even still even more than um, the 26th of May 1989, uh, which is still the sort of most extraordinary game of football I've ever been to for obvious reasons. Um, but the one that really has always been with me and probably it's partly to do with my age. You know, I was like, what would I have been? I've been about. Um, 14, something like that. Um, we played, we got into the Fairs Cup. But actually, the season we lost to Swindon in the Fairs Cup final, we did actually manage. We were starting to be a half decent team, and we did actually finish high enough in the table to get into um, what used to be called, well, it's now the Europa League through various um, incarnations, but then it was called the, uh, the Fairs Cup. <coughs> And uh, that that used to be a really, really strong competition. If you imagine, because back then only the champions qualified for the European Cup. So the yeah. teams that finished second, third, fourth from each country, they would go into the Fairs Cup, which meant that was an incredibly difficult competition. Um, you know, in some ways, it was even more difficult to win than the European Cup because, of course, yeah, you had to win the league in your country. But once you'd won the league in the country, your country and gone into the European Cup, you probably had five or six really strong leagues in Europe, but there'd only be one team from each of them. So you could get to a European Cup final and probably only play one decent team on the way to it. You know, it was it was different then. That said, it's still an amazing achievement to have won it, like, you know, like Celtic did in, um, in 67. But... Um, the Fairs Cup was a really big tournament and we played in the final. We beat Anderlecht, who were they were champions of Belgium that that year. And they it was basically the Belgian national team. It was a fantastic team that was in the final two over two legs. And we lost three one in the first leg and came back to Highbury and just 
it was just an amazing night. You know, we had to win. We had to win by two. But if they scored, then we were in trouble. And the atmosphere that night was just unbelievable. Um, you know, well, God, we must have been there about three or four hours before kickoff. And, um, you know, we, the, the atmosphere was just unbelievable. The, Arsenal hadn't won anything for 17, 18 years. And you just, even this was a big ask, but everybody give it there. And Eddie Kelly scored after about 20 minutes. We went one nil up. And suddenly everybody in the ground thought, oh, we can do this. And I've never known an atmosphere like it at any football match, really. Oh, wow. um, it was just fantastic. And then we were, you know, we scored a couple of goals into the North Bank at the second half. Um, John Radford scored and then a, a, a John Samuel scored a third and that was us and everybody's on the pitch at the end of the game. It was unbelievable. But the, the, actually the game before that, the semi-final was probably against an even better team. So we played in the semi-final that year. We played Ajax. Now, Ajax had the best player in Europe at the time, Johan Cruyff playing for him, and a lot of other really, really good players. To tell you how good a team that Ajax team was, the, the following three seasons, they won the European Cup three seasons in a row. So that, that was, this is some team. We played them in the semi-final. First leg was a hybrid. And Charlie George, who was, you know, this was a lad who used to watch Arsenal off the North Bank, um, you know, playing for his playing for his club against Johan Cruyff, and they were up against each other in midfield. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And Charlie that night, he was just he looked the best player in the world. It was it remains probably the best I've ever seen an Arsenal player play. You know, the like for a, and maybe until you know Dennis Bergkamp, Thierry Henry, that maybe, but Charlie that night, you know, against a team that good. And he just took him apart. He just absolutely took him apart. He, I think he scored one, made two, something like that. And we beat him 3 0. And that was that those two games, you suddenly thought, hang on, this is a half decent team here. We really have got something. And of course, the season after, we did the double. Um, uh, you know, won the league at Tottenham on the Monday night and then beat Liverpool in the cup final. And, you know, that was, that was, we were only the second team to, to ever do the the double, you know, proper double, not like going back to Victorian times. And, and of course, Tottenham were the first team to do it in 61. And it seemed yeah. like something very special of that when we did what Tottenham had did, you know, what we did what Tottenham had done. And of course, since then, <laughs> since then, well, yeah, since then, you know, the history, I mean, uh, it was, it was a, an amazing year that year and winning the league at YR Lane for the first time that was a that was a good night uh, this is this probably a question that gets asked to most Arsenal fans do you prefer did you prefer the atmosphere at Highbury or do you prefer the Emirates well I think the Emirates gets I think the Emirates gets slightly you know raw deal you've got to think that um, you've got to remember we haven't you know, we've we've won cup finals mm -hmm. at Wembley, but you know, at the Emirates, think about in the league and stuff. I think there've been some amazing atmospheres at the Emirates. You know, yeah. I think that people should bear in mind what that stadium could be like when you think about nights like the night we beat Barcelona two one in the European Cup. It was an amazing league game against Everton. I'm sure people who were there will remember where I think Marouane Fellaini or maybe Louis Sahar, they scored the most offside goal in the history of football and it got given. And it was like the whole stadium just went, we are not having that. And the atmosphere was unbelievable. So, you know, you know, if you think about what it's been like at Arsenal Tottenham games, you think about not so much this season, but the season before, you know, when we when we beat them 4-2. Uh, you just yeah. think about the atmosphere at those games. So I, I think that I can remember amazing atmospheres. They, You know, you've got to remember, they used to call Highbury the library. Um, so it's always been, and don't let anybody fool you. It's the same with every club. Every now and again, you get a fantastic atmosphere. Yeah. And lots of games. Lots of games, people go and they watch, and half the time you could hear a pin drop. And 
you know, don't let anybody kid you. It's the same at Tottenham. It's the same at Tottenham. It's the same at, actually, Tottenham, are, Tottenham, there's a better atmosphere more at a time, funny enough, for whatever reason. But, you know, all the ones that are so famous for the atmosphere, like Anfield and all of this, you go to games at Anfield. There's plenty of times when you could hear a pin drop. So, yeah. look, there were great atmospheres at Ibrin. Obviously, it was better because you were standing up. And when you're standing up at football, you're involved with the game in a way that you never are when you're sitting down. When you're sitting down, you're a member of an audience, you're a customer. When you're standing up, you're a support. Particularly if you've spent three hours standing up before the game even starts, it's a different kind of experience. So look, there were atmospheres at, at Highbury that will never be touched. But I, I'm, I'm not one of those who, who wants to go, oh, look, the Emirates is rubbish. There's no atmosphere. Hey, on good nights, there's good nights and good afternoons. There's a fantastic atmosphere at the Emirates, yeah. and I'm sure there will be in the future. Yeah, I agree with you there. Um, how do you see the future of our club going with Arteta as head coach? Well, I think um, I, I, I'm not sure about where the club's at as a club. You know, I think that. Um, <coughs> combinations of how football's changed generally, uh, certainly the change of ownership, obviously the move to the new stadium and how much that cost and everything that went with it. Um, the uh, yeah, Just the change in football culture generally, I think has put Arsenal, you know, at a disadvantage in many ways. Um, and for me, none of those things have made watching Arsenal better. Um, it, it, but that's true generally. I, I, you know, I don't think I don't think any of that has made watching football generally in the Premier League better. I, I, I don't, you know, I look at Premier League football now, and I'll be honest with you, I haven't missed it the last couple of months. I mean, it's all a bit of a soap opera, really. It's just um it's so you know everybody's got an opinion about it and it's all over the papers and the telly and it's just everywhere and you sometimes you think it's it's kind of 10 miles wide and one inch deep if you know what i mean it, it, it doesn't it's like a kind of this branded global entertainment and it doesn't really kind of get me in the way that football used to and that might be to do with my age um and it might be yeah I, i'm sure it's a combination of my age and having had experience of what what went before and also because i go and watch a lot of other football i go and watch a lot of lower league football um you know i've got a lot of mates in football so i'll go and catch up with people whether they're coaches or managers or scouts or just you know other fans i'll go to other games and you know i kind of there are things about lower league football at the moment that I, if anything i've missed more going to watch lower league football where you just stood behind the goal or you know, it, it's um, so so where Arsenal's at. I, look, I'm I'm very um, I'm very uh, optimistic about um, Arteta. I think um, I think Arteta is a guy who served the club well. I think he's a serious guy. He's a man of integrity. He's honest. I think he understands Arsenal in a way that perhaps a lot of people around the club don't understand Arsenal in many ways. You know, they've come there for different reasons um, and from different backgrounds and perhaps don't bring that sense of history and culture uh, that Arteta has. And I think he's good at his job. <coughs> I think he's, you know, I, I, I'm guessing that, you know, you just, you know, I've done a couple of things with him in the past and, um, Funny enough, ran into him a little while before he joined as, you know, he took the Arsenal job. And I just think the guy is kind of serious about it and I think has got real ability. And and most importantly, I think he's very, he's a good communicator. He's very honest and he's very um, direct. So I think, you know, it's like with anything, you want to know where you stand. And I think people... With Arteta as manager, I think people will know where they stand. And, and I think that can count for a lot. Um, and I hope that the club will trust him. Yeah. That, you know, that he'll be given, the, 
you know, that he will be able to take responsibility for decisions and stuff. You know, um, obviously you had a man in Arsene Wenger who ran everything. And we kind of went in the opposite direction. And obviously, you know, we had Unai Emery who, you know, I think tried to do some really good things and um, I, 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 and definitely was the right man at, at the time because I think it was too early for Arteta to have the job yeah. straight after Wenger. But you felt that he wasn't really a man with power. You, you didn't really feel that he was in control of situations. In fact, funny enough, he's done a few interviews lately where he said as much. And I hope that Arteta will be more in control. You know, I feel like Arteta is there at the front of the club. He's, he's a leader. He was a leader as a player, and I think he can be a, a real leader as a, as a manager. And so I'm, I'm kind of optimistic about what we can do with him in charge, to be honest. He seems to be like he's brought the energy back into the players, in, into the club itself. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, you always see that when you change managers. Yeah. You always see things pick up a bit. And actually, results haven't been so fantastic. And actually, performances haven't been that brilliant. But you're right, there is something that you go, this feels different. And I do think. Um, that is down to Arteta. And although you see it, always see it when a, or often see it when a new manager comes in, you know, you've got to remember Unai Emery came in and a year and a half ago, we went like 20 games unbeaten. Yeah. And people are thinking, oh, we've got our Arsenal back when we're 5 1 up at Fulham. People forget that. So obviously, you always get a bit of a bounce, but I just feel with Arteta, he's a guy for the long run. And uh, I think it will last and I think he will improve things. It won't stay still. So, uh, no, I, I'm, I'm optimistic. Um, oh, we're a mile think... off winning anything, by the way. We're a mile off being able to compete at the top of the league or anything like that. Yeah. But all you want, you want, you watch your team and what you want, you want to see, one, you want to see there's a plan. Well, I think Arteta's got a plan. And two, you want to see the, the players give everything. And I think increasingly, more and more players in Arsenal shirts are giving everything since Arteta has been in charge. So that will do for me for the time being. I'm afraid that building a team that can win the league will have to wait for a while. Especially with the younger players as well, like your Willocks, your Sackers and your Martinellis. They seem to be the sort of players that are mostly bringing back what it means to play for the badge as such. Yeah, yeah. Well, it remains to be seen whether people like Saka, you know, and Eddie and people, you know, it's a different world now. And all of those guys have got agents and they've got aggressive agents who, who you know, want to move them around and aren't really interested in players staying at one club for, you know, they're not interested in the next Tony Adams, they're not interested in the next Paul Pogba. You know what I mean? Let's move him here, move him there and, you know. So I'm not... Um, You'll wait to see. But definitely there is, there are a little group there. Remains to be seen how many of them will actually be good enough, you know. Um, but I think there's a there's a core of young players there that you can be optimistic about. And I think it's always been part of the, um, it's always been part of the history of the club, really. I think most of our successful teams have, have, have always had an element, certainly going back, have always had that core of homegrown players. You know, you think about that double team of 70-71, you think about George Graham team, you know, those, those that won the league at Anfield, those teams had four or five homegrown players. They also had good experienced players around them, but they had that homegrown core and I, I, I like to see that. And I think, yeah, I think all fans like to see homegrown players in the team, but I think Arsenal fans in particular want to see young players do well. Um, do you feel like we're currently missing anything from the squad? Um, or do you not think we're missing anything at all? Well, if we weren't anything, missing anything at all, then Liverpool wouldn't have been whatever it is. What, how many points ahead of us are they? 30, 40? God, it's ridiculous. Yeah. No, we're missing lots. Do you know what I mean? We are... Well, let's put it like this. You would 
you would struggle if you if you look at the teams, the two teams who have kind of set the standard really the last couple of years. So that's that's the level you've got to reach, Liverpool and Manchester City. You've got to think how many of our players would get into either of those teams. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, think on. You know, so even even our best players, even our best players would struggle to get into the best teams. So I think that is, you know, that is a, a kind of that tells you. It tells you that we've got some good players, uh, some very good players. But even our very good players are they actually good enough to compete at the you know yes at the top end of a fantastic team you think you know if Aubameyang can get the golden boot mm -hmm. playing for this team then you think wow we'll put him in a team that makes twice as many chances and how many goals are you going to score and you've got you've got players who you think well they're as good as what other teams have got but are they better you know I think you have to have to look to win the league I think at least half of your players have to be the best players in their position in the league. They have to be the best. Yeah. <clears throat> and we're nowhere near that. So I wouldn't criticise any individual players. I think that it's just a case of younger players improving, bringing in players who can help those young players, who can kind of lift the overall standard. Um, and then I think it's you know, for for the manager to get the absolute most out of the players he's already got. Um, so I think we're missing quite a lot, actually. But mm -hmm. I don't mind starting with getting back one young players in the team and two players who are prepared to leave everything on the pitch at the end of every game. And I think if we have those two, that will do for a start for me. And then we can yeah. think about slowly building towards something better. Um, conscious of time here, so just uh, one last question to touch up on. Um, yeah. What are your opinions on this supposed project restart? How do you, how do you feel about it? Um, I think uh, actually, I think I think that maybe people will have learnt quite a lot. A lot. Some people will already know. A lot of people. Everybody knows now. Football's not about football anymore. Football's about money. Because if football was about football, we wouldn't even be thinking of playing before next season. We wouldn't even be thinking about it. However, in the Premier League, in one way, and lower down the leagues in another, in the Premier League, Money says you've got to play. In the lower yeah. leagues, actually, funny enough, it's the opposite. Money says you can't afford to play. Um, but either way, it's about money. And uh, so Project Restart, I've heard some names for things in my time, and that is right up there. That is an absolutely... That, that's the kind of soap opera I mean. What kind of name for anything is Project Restart? I mean, whoever thought of it, you just go, oh, blimey, they must, you know, that's not something that comes from football. That's something that comes out of a marketing agency. Do you know what I mean? It's Project Restart is pathetic. Um, but anyway, what I feel about it is that uh, I think it's about as sensible as sending kids back to school at this stage, to be perfectly honest. Um, so the only reason we're doing it is for financial reasons because the Premier League <clears throat> would have to give so much money back to broadcasters yeah. that they are willing to risk the safety of players and their families to fight, play football in circumstances that make no sense at all to the game. Football without supporters is not professional football. No. Football without supporters, that's a game you play. That's not a game, you know. That's a game you play for fun. That's what you do over the park. Playing football professionally with no supporters in the stadium. What's that about? That's not football. No, no. So it tells you that if they're prepared to countenance that, 
then football has become entirely at the top end it has become a broadcasting property what they call an asset yeah. and that's what's being argued about the conversation is not about football as a game it's not about the important things in life like people's safety and the safety of their families and you know where the country is in relation to this this particular crisis it's only about the value of the asset and it you know both broadcasters and football premier league the premier league have decided they cannot afford for games not to be played and that's the reason we're playing we're not playing for any sporting reasons there are no sporting reasons we're playing so that premier league clubs and broadcasters can make their money it's as simple as that um and that doesn't really do it for me um and project restart is probably a good name for that because it's yeah. it tells you where it's coming from uh so you know what i'm <laughs> you know and you look at the people who own premier league football clubs for the most part and you go well you know can't they swallow it really can't they no. swallow it um what concerns me much more what i'm much more interested in and and bothered about is the fact that lower down the leagues league one league two national league grassroots football you're not talking about all oh, you know we're going to have to hand money back to the broadcasters or the broadcasters are going to have to cancel subscriptions and hand money back to punters what you're talking about is clubs that could disappear they could disappear clubs which look arsenal is a big club a lot of people know about arsenal a lot of people care about and are passionate about arsenal it's got supporters all over the world it's got you know yeah. 40 40 odd thousand people turn up to watch the team play at the emirates every week so you know there's this big audience for it and it matters a lot to a lot of people it matters to you it matters to all of us but i go to watch barnet in the national league or I go and watch Cheltenham Town in League Two, or I go and watch, um, you know, Fleetwood Town in League One, whatever it is. The crowds are tiny. There's probably only three and a half thousand people in the world who it matters to, but it really yeah. matters to them. And in many ways, those clubs are more important to their communities than Premier League clubs are anymore to their communities mm -hmm. because they're more embedded still, and their attention is devoted to their local community. And so those clubs disappearing i think gives not only gives football a problem it gives it gives our society a problem you know if, if you go anywhere else in the world i made television programs about this to be honest because it's so important if you go anywhere in the world what's fantastic what's unique about english football is not the premier league no that is not what's unique about the premier the premier league is a global league that happens to be staged in the uk okay the Premier League, La Liga, the Bundesliga, Liga, Serie A, you know, they're all top leagues, teams full of players from all over the world. The best of those teams, you know, are, are playing against each other in Europe. It's one thing. OK. What sets English football apart is that we have well over 100 professional football clubs on this little island you know and they've been there's there's that passion for football on a local level that can sustain or has sustained professional football in in little towns and villages where anywhere else in the world those clubs would be little amateur clubs they'd be clubs where people were paying to play you know what I mean they'd be paying subs to play here football matters so much so far down and is so embedded in our local communities that we can sustain professional football clubs in towns the size of you know barrow or fleetwood or um you know cheltenham or uh blimey down the road from me there's a you know there's a there's a league two club a professional club in nailsworth there's only 600 people live in nailsworth <laughs> so what i'm saying is to lose those clubs would cost us more yeah 
than for Premier League clubs to suffer, than for Premier League clubs to lose their top players, than for Premier League clubs to have to, you know, it, to suffer. That is what would cost us in English football. You look, we lost Berry this season. We could lose another 10 or 15 because yeah. of C19. And that, that's what matters. Not whether I can watch Premier League football on the telly in a stadium with no fans. That's what matters to me. I think I have to agree with you on that one. I think most people of my age will probably disagree with all of that. But I honestly, I totally 100% agree with well, you Well, it there. depends. If, if they're... I mean, it's interesting. If you look at football in the Football League, if you look at football outside the Premier League, actually, crowds are going up and more and more of those crowds are young people because Premier League football now, who can afford it? And even if you can afford it, you've got to make your plans weeks in advance. Oh, you've got to be a you know, red member, silver member, whatever member. You've got to, you know, you've got to... Still, if you go and watch football in League Two, you can ring up your mates on a Saturday morning and say, should we go to football? And you just go down, pay at the gate, cost you maybe, yeah. you know, a tenner. If you get a season ticket, it probably costs you about a five or a game. You can go with your mates. You can have a right laugh. Football ain't great. But then I don't think the important thing is football being great. The important no. thing is the crack. The important thing is my lot against your lot. It's it's the competition, it's the rivalry, it's the history, it's you know, it's having it's enjoying it. It's enjoying it, come what mate, it's supporting the club, not sitting there waiting for them to win, not sitting there complaining because they don't play beautiful football. It's about it's about something else. And I think more and more young people are actually getting that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because if you look around the country. I think a lot of young people, yeah, they can watch football on TV, but where's the fun in that? You can go and watch football in League Two. You can have a right laugh. You can sing your songs. There might be a scrap after. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's. Mm -hmm. So you say that about people your age. I think people your age are starting to discover what people my age grew up with. And I think the yeah. ones that, the ones that are going are actually thinking, this is really good, this. And they'll they'll miss it if it goes. Uh, so thank you for taking up your time to speak to me no, again. Pleasure, Phil. Pleasure, mate. Uh, pleasure. I really wish you all And I wish you good luck for your future and all your books and everything as well. Thank you very much. Good to talk to you, mate. Thank you.